coronavirus spread silently within herds. Here at Daniel's Mines, we're seeking answers. Gradually, farmers started getting sick. Come with us over the next coming weeks. Infected people got a respiratory illness to severe pneumonia. Many to reality, died. it may not At be first, this reality. Was limited to those with close contacts, healthcare personnel, co workers, and families. But now it's spreading rapidly throughout local communities. International travel has turned local epidemics into a pandemic spanning the globe. The global community has been working to respond to this pandemic since its recognition. We will need all of you to help us respond to advise leaders and national governments, global business, and international organizations on the response to the pandemic. Continuing our coverage of the disease and the scope of its deadly outbreaks, there are now more than 30,000 reported cases. Experts warn this may be just the beginning of a global problem. GNN science reporters have produced a video about what we know so far about CAPS, the virus, the outbreak, and the resulting chaos. CAPS is a novel coronavirus related to those viruses that caused the frightening SARS epidemic in 2003 and the deadly MERS outbreaks in recent years. Scientists think each infected person in turn infects on average two more people. This disease is proving more transmissible than SARS or MERS and about as contagious as influenza. Essentially, the cumulative number of cases is doubling every week. At this rate, we can expect to see 16 times as many cases in a month unless we find a way to interrupt transmission. The virus appears to be spreading rapidly in densely populated and impoverished neighborhoods in some megacities in South America. CAPS is a serious respiratory disease. More than half of the recognized cases have required hospital care, creating a huge strain on healthcare systems. The fatality rate is about 10%. For comparison, CAPS is about as lethal as SARS and two to four times more lethal than the 1918 influenza pandemic, the worst pandemic on record. Even so, some people only exhibit mild flu-like symptoms, not requiring treatment in a hospital. Alarmingly, those people are able to walk around and spread the virus, not realizing they are doing so. Even worse, international travelers have been arriving at their destinations symptom-free, but within a matter of hours, becoming ill. Travel-related cases have blossomed into outbreaks in a number of locations and have quickly grown faster than health authorities could respond and contain them. In other places, physicians have quickly recognized the symptoms of CAPS and have been able to isolate infected individuals and avoid an outbreak, for now. Global public health experts are very concerned about this disease. Because it appears the virus is readily transmitted through the air from person to person, essentially all people are susceptible. Experts agree unless it is quickly controlled, it could lead to a severe pandemic, an outbreak that circles the globe and affects people everywhere. Continuing our CAPS disease coverage and possible solutions, our U.S. affiliate has just released polling results on public expectations for a vaccine. A majority of Americans expect a vaccine to be available within two months, and 65% of those polled are eager to take the vaccine, even if it's experimental. In related news, a significant demand for personal protective equipment like N95 masks and gloves are on the rise due to the pandemic. In addition to global public health crisis, CAPS is creating havoc with the trade and travel industries. The frightening public health toll of CAPS continues to mount. Patients are overwhelming healthcare facilities around the world, including many of the makeshift triage and temporary care facilities. Businesses of all kinds are struggling to operate, let alone provide basic services as their workers have fallen sick or refused to come to work. Some companies have allowed telecommuting, but for most businesses and employees, this is not an option. 
public health agencies have issued travel advisories, while some countries have banned travel from the worst affected areas. As a result, the travel sector is taking a huge hit. Travel bookings are down 45% and many flights have been canceled. Global health experts have highlighted that dis and misinformation are wreaking havoc on the CAPS response. Health workers are under attack in a number of locations due to rumors that they are purposely spreading the disease. And response efforts in many places have had to be suspended because of concerns around violence. Pharmaceutical companies are being accused of introducing the CAPS virus so they can make money on drugs and vaccines and have seen public faith in their products plummet. Unrest due to false rumors and divisive messaging is rising and is exacerbating, exacerbating spread of the disease as levels of trust fall and people stop cooperating with response efforts. This is a massive problem, one that threatens governments and trusted institutions. So here's the policy crisis for this meeting of the board. How can governments, international businesses, international organizations and from spreading and causing deepening crisis around the world. How much control of information should there be and by whom? I think one of the ways that we need to approach this is to make sure that we have the right representatives on traditional media networks in order to uh, portray our side of the story, in order to uh, portray our side of the story, in order to uh, portray our side of the story. Okay, we will now advance three weeks to the fourth and final meeting of the Pandemic Emergency Board on December 18th, 2019. So I agree on the point on having a, a centralized source of information and a world body that could have uh, garner the respect of everyone. And I think the WHO in this instance might be that. Uh, source of information, think the WHO source of information. I own the world, I own the world. In a stunning change, major plans to reopen U.S. Surgeon General Adams dumps Gates predictive contagion model. Yeah. It poses a greater global threat than terrorism. 45 million of us might be killed by it. Catching many experts off guard. Today I was feeling like maybe I was... Back on the breaking news, bleeding with unconfirmed reports is a highly rehearsed scenario. Make me... Let me stop you there. This is not a panic situation. American City. Green poison. Central Park has been converted to a mass burial ground. Power outages, gas line leaks, fires. The government's expecting another night of widespread looting. Is a highly rehearsed scenario. First responders are either dead. No resources available. They treat it like animals. It's not a job. We're not trained for. We're going to begin with the states of emergency across this country, and now here in New York City, a state of emergency declared as well. Is a highly rehearsed scenario. Comes in the race for a vaccine, for a vaccine, for a vaccine. Here at Oxford University, volunteers' blood samples are prepared for testing ahead of the first human trials of a vaccine, for a vaccine, for a vaccine, for a vaccine. so-called coronavirus is some bullshit. I've been talking to military personnel and other personnel that come to my job and in very other sources that I deal with, and a lot of Moors are bringing this information to light. The frequency that those radio waves coming off them towers, they're locking oxygen out of the body. The body can't take oxygen. That's why everybody's passing out, suffocating, because we all know from the history of viruses, you just don't pass out all of a sudden from a virus. Y'all, this is not a fucking virus that we're dealing with now. 
they're using this as a ploy. They can shut shit down and they can start vaccinating y'all. And if y'all take that vaccine, y'all dumb as hell. Is a highly rehearsed scenario. Is a highly rehearsed scenario. Is a highly rehearsed scenario. An entire American city. Known as the Green Poison, Central Park has been converted to a mass barrier. Power outages, gas line leaks, fires. The government's We're expecting another night of widespread looting. The people of New York are begging. What would it? Fire and First responders are either dead. No resources available. They treat it like animals. It's not a job. We're not trained for. The World Health Organization says it poses a greater global threat than terrorism. We're going to begin with the states of emergency across this country and now here in New York City, state of emergency declared as well. Just one month after the U.S. reported its first COVID-19 death, America has become the epicenter of the pandemic. The gains, they're gone. Energy, tech, consumer leading the sell-off. Dozens of laboratories are now battlegrounds in the race for a vaccine. In the race for a vaccine, for a vaccine, for a vaccine. Is a highly rehearsed scenario. Is a highly rehearsed scenario. Hello, everyone. I'm Anita Cicero, Deputy Director of the Johns Hopkins Center for Health Security. And today I will be your Master of Ceremonies for Event 201. On behalf of our center and our partners, the World Economic Forum and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. The goal of the event 201 exercise is to illustrate the potential consequences of a pandemic. Today's scenario is going to simulate meetings of a multi-stakeholder group called the Pandemic Emergency Board. And Johns Hopkins has been asked to provide expertise during the board's deliberations. The mission of the Pandemic Emergency Board is to provide recommendations to deal with the major global challenges arising in response to an unfolding pandemic. We've created a pandemic that could realistically occur. The policy discussions, the challenges represent controversial high stakes issues that would require high level input from business and government leaders. Uh, you will be seeing the same news videos and briefings that you will as engage in your own online discussion. When you're in that, in that, some, in that virtual reality, which is only going to get better. Where are you? Where are you really? It's your perception. It will be at some point indistinguishable from reality. We want to talk about COVID-19 for a few minutes. And the uh, first thing I want to say is, is, does it look like there's a ventilator shortage? There's not. Okay, as a matter of fact, we're running less ventilators right now than uh, we would normally run. Uh, I want to talk about the numbers uh, and the criteria that goes into uh, what a COVID patient is or a patient under investigation, what's also called a PUI. Uh, basically right now, the way it has been the last couple of months when they locked us down, is that any patient that came in with a respiratory problem uh, was labeled COVID. We're in hospice and had already been given 
you know, a few weeks to live, and then you also were found to have COVID, that would be counted as a COVID death. It means that if, um, it technically, if even if you died of a clear alternate cause, but you had COVID at the same time, it's still listed as a COVID death. Finally, so we'll be moving towards this mass vaccination campaign. We've already bought the syringes. We already know where it's going to happen. We're thinking about what that's going to be. It's all part of this plan. Show us how drones work. The drones make it easier for police to see into certain areas where access by patrol cars is more difficult. That includes tight spaces between buildings, behind schools, and in backyards. All to help enforce social distancing rules. You should not be congregating in groups. 5G fifth generation technology promises faster download speeds and conveniences that most of us have never dreamed of, but will also be blanketed with a new type of radiation called millimetre waves. Health experts are warning about the rising risks with a 5G rollout. It's not been made clear to the public that 5G won't just be another number and letter on your cell phone. It requires an entirely new infrastructure of thousands of small cellular antennas to be erected throughout cities where it's going to be installed. Scientists from 42 countries are now warning their governments about the emerging health problems associated with wireless radiation. The most prevalent symptoms include headache, fatigue, decreased ability to concentrate, tinnitus, irritability and insomnia. Impacts on the heart and the nervous system are also of great concern. Dr. Rena Bray has been working at the Provincial Environmental Health Clinic for 15 years and seen the number of people suffering adverse effects from electromagnetic exposure rising. We are concerned that the upcoming introduction of 5G will significantly increase the proximity and extent of exposure to microwave radiation in Ontarians. We predict that the number of people who develop the symptoms I just mentioned will rise in the places where 5G is first installed. At lower frequency, scientists are predicting damage to eyes, loss of insect populations which are already declining, antibiotic resistance in bacteria and physiological effects on the nervous system and on the immune system. Radiation from radio frequencies is classed in the same category of carcinogens as lead. One advisor to the World Health Organization said there's enough evidence that if they were to re-evaluate radio frequency radiation, it would be placed in class one, i.e. a human carcinogen. Can we afford to take this risk? Um, anything that would go against World Health Organization recommendations would be a violation of our policy, and so remove is another really important part of our policy. I'm sure I'm going to get some hate messages after this. Frankly, I don't care because this could save someone's life. Um, I'm a nurse practitioner. I am licensed and certified. I am not on the front lines. I have a friend in New York City who's on the front lines. And for her safety, she cannot come out and say these things. So I am her voice. I'm not going to name names of people or hospitals for the safety of those involved. Um, but this is her account, okay? I am her voice here. I'm going to tell you what she has told me. She wants this to get out. Now, I'm sure this is not the case everywhere. I, I'm confident. I, I have friends that are in other places. They're on the front lines. They're in ICU. And it's not like this everywhere. But in New York City right now, in some of the hospitals, this is what is going on. People are sick, but they don't have to stay sick. They are killing them. They are not helping them. She used the word murder, coming from a nurse who went to New York City expecting to help. Patients are left to rot and die. Her words. She has never seen so much neglect. No one cares. They are cold and they don't care anymore. It's the blind leading the blind. Now, a couple of weeks ago, I was on with some nurse friends of mine and we were discussing different medications that could be used to potentially help people. Doctors who were reporting around the country that they were using a combination of medications that were helping people. People were not dying when they were on these medications. They were getting better. Those medications are not being used in hospitals in New York City. What is happening 
is that they're putting people on nasal cannula if they require more than six liters of nasal cannula they get intubated they go on the vent or they get traked if there's not enough vents they don't get high flow no non-rebreather no non-invasive ventilation no CPAP no BiPAP they're on a closed system the ventilator versus a CPAP or a BiPAP for fear that it will spread the virus which by the way I know a nurse in Florida who was fired for exposing that about CPAP and BiPAP and patients being put on the ventilator like straight away to the ventilator to be on a closed system the patients don't know any better they don't have family with them there is no one there with them to advocate for them so they are scared and they give consent the ventilators have high peep high pressure which then causes barotrauma it causes trauma to the lungs dr uh Sidel, cameron kyle Sidel, a few weeks ago put out a video he's in new york city and he put out a video saying something is not right like we're not treating this correctly we're doing something wrong this doesn't make sense they pulled his video from youtube and they took him out of icu because they couldn't have one doctor going against the grain going against their protocol the protocol is propofol or some kind of sedation because they're on the ventilator and IV antibiotics. There's no hydroxychloroquine. They're not using that combination with Zithromax. They're not using zinc, vitamin C, high doses of vitamins A and D. They laugh. This is what she's told me. They laugh at that. She says, this is a nightmare. It's out of a horror movie and I don't want to be a part of this. There are people who are a full code and yet, if they crash, they're not doing compressions because it will spread the virus. Full code, not doing compressions. Family is not there. They have no one to answer to. No one is being held accountable. A code was called and no one came. So sometimes they're not even resuscitating people. Again, left to rot and die. They're not given blood because we know that the blood is not oxygenated in these COVID patients. We know that. There, there are doctors all around the world sounding the alarms. These are the drugs that work. This is the pathophysiology of the, de the disease. This is what's happening. And for some reason, it's not changing. Even though we know, some of us know what's going on, nothing is changing on the front lines. They stay in the same PPE, all shift, except for the top pair of gloves. So two pairs of gloves, or I don't know, maybe more than two, but they're only changing the gloves on the outside gown mask whatever else stays the same because all patients are covid patients so if it's a covid floor it's all covid but it's not because some of them are rule out covid so even if they're rule out covid and they're not covid they're going to get covid because they're using the same ppe all shift and they're carrying that contamination to all the patients they're not changing their ppe so they're running long tubing into the room so that they can manage the tubing from outside of the rooms so if they're not going into the rooms that means they're not assessing the patients as frequently as you would be otherwise assessing your patients. They are not doing rapid result tests. You're lucky if you get results in five days. Okay, this is coming from my friend who is in New York City right now on assignment, who went there to help, and this is what she's finding. It's a horror movie, she says. Not because of the disease, but because of the way it's being handled something it will cause damage or death there will be an outcry there will be an investigation years will pass there will be some sort of insight committee there will be rulemaking then there will be oversight eventually regulations this all takes many years this is the normal course of things it's too late your phone is already an extension of you you're already a cyborg. You don't even, well, most people don't realize they are already a cyborg. It, that phone is an extension of yourself. It's just that the, the data rate, the rate at which, of, of the communication rate between you and the cybernetic extension of yourself, that is your phone and computer, is slow. It will be, at some point, indistinguishable from reality. Or civilization will end.